Welcome to the Monday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 586. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 23rd of March, 2020. All right, welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. The pandemic is still going around the world, and uh, it's really taking foothold here in the U.S. Uh, New York City has been devastated. Clearly, Italy, Spain, uh, China. I don't know about the rest of the, uh, the European Union, but this disease is still making its way. And uh, George, Gavin, and I, as reporters are, are are kind of in the middle of it because we want to be encouraging to you the church which we naturally are encouragers we want to be sure that you understand that uh, uh, you as believers are the light in this and you're the salt in this and uh, we want you to take the encouragement we try to give you uh, into these dark regions um, uh, expressing your love for Jesus so we gather and, and understand all that before we get too far into the program, it's time to do the like, the share, the comment. Comments are great. Keep the comments up. I read all the comments. Uh, keep that alive. And if you're not subscribed yet, click subscribed. If you're new to this channel and you say, oh my gosh, if only there was a podcast of it, there is a podcast. Go to the YouTube page, look in the show notes for any of these shows, and there's a link to the podcast. We're going to have some fun topics today. We're going to start off with whether or not this is God's judgment upon the earth. And listen closely to our definitions. Have fun. Understand Noah. <laughs> and it will, be, it, it will be a great topic. Let's start with you, Gavin. <laughs> COVID-19. Has God woken up angry at the earth and cast upon it a pandemic and the pestilence of the locusts and the earthquakes going on in Yellowstone Park and over in Croatia. Is this God's judgment upon his earth? One of the things that struck me very forcibly over the last few weeks is the squeals of discomfort coming from people the moment that's raised. Uh, this Any idea of a, of a close linkage between our moral collective behavior, the purity of God, and the fact that things are going wrong in our world at the moment, seems to cause people a great deal of distress. And that very act of distress, the sort of shrill cries of, no, 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 it can't possibly be like that, makes me wonder if it probably is. Um, I, I think, of course, that we need to remember that we're talking theologically or analogically rather than scientifically. So when we say uh, God is causing things, what we're really doing is having a, a theological exploration, rather like Job did. See, my poor servant Job, says the Lord, and Satan comes along and says, yeah, he's only your servant because he's comfortable. Give me five minutes with him and he'll soon change. Um, and, and, and the father says, yes. So in that sense, the book of Job, like the whole of the Old Testament, is a theological tightening of the reins of intimacy between God and people. Why? Because the heart, the basic thesis is we're made in his image. And because we're made in his image, we can't escape the consequences of, of being the children of a holy God, which means just as teenagers begin to draw upon themselves the wrath of parents when they behave badly at home, when we start behaving badly in God's universe and we find ourselves in rebellion, rather like throwing things against the wall, they bounce back and hurt us. So I, I think to say that the pandemic is a judgment of God in theological terms is no more than saying, if you live badly in a universe where you are created to live in a holy way by a holy creator, uh, don't be surprised if things become profoundly disruptive and cause you harm. It's not so much a uh, a slander of an unkind God as the recognition that we live in a moral universe and are morally unaccountable. So it's a theological way of trying to make that clear. 
Well, as an Anglican and an evangelical Christian, I would say this is just part and parcel to living in a fallen world. Okay, this is this just comes as, as the package of a fallen world. George, uh, help me out here. Usually, I say yes, but I'm going to say no, but. <laughs> No, I do not believe God is petulant or mercurial and his uh, smiting the Amokites hip and thigh because of their wickedness. I don't believe God does that. I don't believe in collective punishment. I believe in individual judgment. And part of the, well, I agree with 90% of what Gavin says, except about what the word judgment really means. And I, I view judgment in terms of person, uh, individual judgment. I don't believe God judges races or people or tribes or countries and condemns all to the same punishment. I believe each individual stands alone before God, the Father, at the final judgment with Christ at his side. So, uh, I, in other words, it, there's a tendency to go down the uh, Pat Robertson road saying these poor evil Haitians practice voodoo. Uh, they uh, do all these terrible things. Therefore, God in his righteousness sends them earthquakes, plagues, and, and all these terrible things. Well, Southern California is a pretty rotten place, and they don't have earthquakes, <laughs> plagues, and all this stuff. Yes, they have Democratic politicians running the county, but no, that's not on the same level. Well, they do have earthquakes in San Francisco, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. But but see, see, as I understand it, uh, I don't. Uh, we we. I think where you're coming from, I agree with Kevin on this point that we live in a fallen, broken world. That a person who succumbs to the coronavirus is no worse than a person who survives it. Evil people prosper. Good people suffer. Does that mean that God is favoring the evil and punishing the righteous? No, it doesn't. It means we live in a fallen, broken world where we must, you know, yesterday's gospel reading uh, was uh, from John and the man born blind, and the disciples uh, respond, ask the question based upon their cultural understanding. Jesus, why was this born man born blind? What did he do or what did his parents do? And Jesus didn't go down that road, but, and he basically said, that's not the right question to answer. I'm not going to answer that question. What I am going to say is, what do you do in these circumstances? Do you bring glory to God in your brokenness and your suffering? Now, you perhaps could make the argument that God gives you this brokenness and suffering so that you can glorify him, but I wouldn't say that that is an absolute requirement. It can be helpful in certain individuals. It can be destructive in other individuals. But in these times, I think it's a fool's foolishness to basically say, why is God punishing me or this and that? The answer is, I don't know. But I know what you need to do in this time of crisis, well, which I, is honor the Lord in all things and let your light shine, let his light shine through you on the world. I've always wanted to take a step back when you know I feel like I'm uh, being punished and saying, am I being tested? Uh, there are years that I've had that have been rough years financially or family or um, physically when I had uh, type 2 diabetes you know I just am I being tested is God stressing me to make me stronger and I look at pandemics and I look at earthquakes and just in my lifetime I look at what happened and I always see the world coming out stronger after dealing with the test no matter what the test was and becoming wiser and never trotting down that again. Sure, history repeats itself here and there, but I think, hopefully, in my hopefully the the socialism of the 1920s to uh, the hundred million killed. I hope that's over. I would hope that okay, you know Maoism and stuff like that that we've learned from it. So but, I, but I, look, I, I, well, I just want to finish. Are we being tested or is it judgment? Sorry to interrupt. That's right. No, no. Um, we, 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 we can avoid the, the usual silliness of people who talk past each other without recognizing that we're all addressing different questions. Uh, it's, we're like a group of archaeologists, and George is looking at the first foot down, I'm looking at the next foot down, and Kevin is looking at the third layer down, and each of these layers belongs to a different time span, and we're coming up with different answers. And that doesn't mean archaeology is bust, it means we're looking at different phenomena. So George, sure. quite rightly, is asking the question about the distinction between personal and corporate sin. And quite rightly, he's saying, 
that the Gospels tell us that the emphasis is on our personal accountability. You get that in in both the in, the, in both the Old Testament, shall the children have their teeth set on edge by the sins of their fathers? And along comes a prophet and says, that's going to end now. And, and George quite rightly says the best example of that is in the Gospels. But quite wrongly, George then leaves out some other material because it doesn't suit that argument. Or be, because the question I'm ask, asking is not, is not that. I agree with what George has said. Um, I'm asking a different question. Jesus also says when he's looking at the Tower of Siloam, uh, yes, it didn't fall down because they were badly behaved. But he says there is a link between bad behavior and suffering and it's coming to you and it's going to involve the fall of Jerusalem. And you've no idea how much trouble you're going to get in if you don't repent. So you better repent. They don't and Jerusalem falls. So there are two, there is an individual suffering. There is a collective suffering. And as Kevin quite rightly says, there is a third more mystical level of the way in which we walk through the circumstances both personal and collective and the holy spirit then deepens our relationship with god which is a form of stress testing just as you said so here we have three different questions uh, is there any is there a primacy of individual respons responsibility yes george is right is there a relationship between corporate bad behavior and, and and judgmental circumstances rebounding on the head of the community Yes, that's what Jesus says. Uh, do we grow in wisdom as we negotiate the personal and the corporate? As Kevin says, yes, we do. That's what the Holy Spirit says. What we mustn't do is, is to assume that the particular question that we're answering negates the insights of, our, of the other two questions that, that we've addressed at the same time. Let, let's clarify the question and tailor the answer to that question. Very good. Wow, I think we covered it. <laughs> I was worried about this, you know, when I when I pressed record, I said, we're going to be talking about whether or not God is judging the earth. This is going to be fun. And it really was fun. Um, but, 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 but can I just raise one? I, I, I okay, it's up. very, it, it's still very interesting that. So, so now we've, we've, we've broadly agreed there are several questions and we need to answer each question in the terms it's put. Okay. It's still terribly interesting that, that, that there is this deep anxiety about about some about the level of dis corporate distress um, being our moral fault, um, I, I I picked up some uh, some rather mystical prophetic stuff that came to me from a French Catholic, and I've no idea who from. And as I read it, I thought, oh, a third of this I really am uncomfortable with. A third of this is quite interesting, and a third of this hits all the buttons, and I think is really good. Um, and and some of the buttons it hit, the Lord was saying. I'm profoundly angry with you for 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 killing children. Uh, I'm I'm profoundly angry with you for destroying the categories of sexuality I created, uh, and and there will be there are consequences, and you're in the middle of one of the consequences now. Uh, it's extraordinary that people, uh, all, all of that I can see as being perfectly likely, um, and I and I think what are people saying when they say we are uncomfortable with the idea that we are accountable to God? And anything gone wrong in our lives may be an echo of that. And I think what they're really doing is saying we don't want to be morally accountable in terms of holiness, which is why I, I think there's some, despite the fact that both you and George have quite rightly addressed these important questions, I think there is some scope for saying to the world, if you misbehave in God's creation and you pursue wickedness or unholiness or, or abuse, um, you may very, you will find it redounds on you. It's it's the same thing as happens in ecologically. F fill fill the rich oceans with plastic, and you'll end up eating plastic, and you won't like it. <laughs> and well, why do the innocent suffer? Because why do why why bother being a martyr? Because if you repent, but you're still going to suffer. Therefore, is your repentance not genuine? Because. Uh, in other words, if I follow your line of thinking, Gavin, and your 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 twist of Bibli your understanding of biblical interpretation, <laughs> my what? <laughs> oh, come no, on! It, it, it's, no, I mean how, how you. I'm not saying it's twisted, but the the turn you, you take in the turn you take, and it's interpreting the story of the uh, Tower of Siloam. Uh, Jesus was talking uh, apocalyptically; he wasn't talking uh, collectively, because people did repent. That's where the church came from. Yet these people, uh, people suffered. Um, I'd, I'm, I'm not persuaded by the, uh, 
Yes, I believe that uh, bad things happen in this world, but they happen alike to good and uh, evil people. I'm not, I don't, and where I am very uncomfortable is saying that this particular episode was planned by God to achieve this particular aim. I, th I don't think that question can ever be answered uh, and because we, it implies that we have a knowledge of God's mind and purposes. And I think it's uh, presumptuous of us to say, to make, to try to make that connection. And yeah, when George, we look at what Jesus is saying is Jesus says, don't do it. Jesus is saying, don't try to find the link. Rather live your life now according to the light that I have showed you. And th this is where I'm coming from. I'm not disagreeing with the idea that bad things happen and God is angry with abortion and God is angry with the Holocaust and God is angry with slavery and God is angry with all these things. But what I am saying is that we cannot say that uh, the, the defeat of Germany, uh, the victory of the United States, you know, it's, it's take it on the other hand. I might just say that the United States is God's anointed people because we've won all these wars. We beat the Germans. We beat this. We beat the that. Uh, we, we won the Cold War. Therefore, God must love us. Therefore, everything is wonderful. Okay, George, that, with respect, that, uh, we lost Congress, to the commies in Vietnam. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, but, but George, what you've done is you've, you've, you've taken what I tried to make as a finely nuanced argument. Uh, you, you snipped away the nuance, made a brick out of it, and dropped it on my foot. I wasn't saying those things. I, at no point did I say that, that, that the theology I had was that God has wrapped up this pandemic and, and punished us with us. I was saying there's a causal linkage. That, that, that causal linkage is complex. And, and very few of us understand it properly. What I'm uncomfortable with is, a, so you're uncomfortable with the people who make the causal linkage too close, and I'm uncomfortable with the people who make it too dilute. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, this is why we have comment section. <laughs> I suspect you out there in Anglican land are gonna to wanna to tell us what you think or tell us where you think we're wrong, or tell us how much you think Kevin is right. That's fine too. If you just want to put, Kevin, you're right, you nailed it, no big deal. You can write that in the comments. I would completely understand. I do want to move on and talk about what I saw on my Facebook page all day Sunday. I'm going through my profile and looking at all my friends who mostly are priests in the Anglican Church around the world, and I'm seeing them sit down in front of their desk in their office and they're doing morning prayer. I see them in the sanctuary that's empty except for their iPhone and um, the table where they're behind the altar and they're preaching. I see them uh, doing what they did way beyond their comfort, comfort zone and putting the church in digital format online. I saw George do it. I've seen Gavin do it for years. And I'm, I was very impressed, and yet I'm like, I hope this isn't the new church. I hope this is not we, where we end up in three years. I hope this is just a short-term experiment. Um, George, tell us your experience yesterday as a, a brand new uh, live streamer. Were you nervous? Very much so. Yeah. I think it's the most nervous I've been before service in 20, 25 years. Most weekends this time of year, I run six, we have six shows over the weekend. And I will uh, preach five of them and have maybe three or four different sermons. And we'll run up to 300 people through all the different services. And so there's, uh, so there's really no time and there's no real inclination to do things podcasting because the fear is, well, you don't want to give people an excuse not to come stay home in their pajamas and watch you on TV. Uh, well, now we have to do that. So I, by myself, I went into the, I rehearsed on Saturday, did the service Sunday morning, and except when I put my vestments on, I snapped a cuff link and in my nervousness and turned off the microphone as I'm struggling to get my surplus over my head. And so I didn't have sound for the first eight minutes, but I pulled it off. But I was so, that, I was so uh, frightened because, well, just as uh, at one time, 
the great actors of the 1920s had a terrible time moving from Broadway to the theater because in Broadway, you have exaggerated actions and Broadway facial movies. expressions, sure, yeah. movies, and then you get on the small screen and you look like a total idiot. Um, when I preach, I preach with, I move my arms, I move about the, the sanctuary, I'm active, I'm vibrant, and now I got to stand still and not shout and speak before a camera with no way to sort of gauge what the popular reaction is. So it was very frightening, and but it, it's a skill that you learn. It, and so it, hopefully I'll learn how to do it better. It is. I mean, when I speak or teach you know, to 5, 10, 15 people, I feed off their, their facial expressions. Are they, are they into this? Do they understand what I'm saying? Are they laughing at my jokes? Or do they have their iPhones open? They're looking at something else. You, you get that you, that feedback, that instant feedback when you're speaking in front of a group. When you turn the camera on, I, when I was live streaming last week, it was me staring at a camera, and there's just no feedback. Right now, I'm looking at the three the three of us on screen. It's it's a teleprompter, so I get that I, George is looking right at me, Gavin's looking at me, and I'm pointing at me. That's weird. And so this is, you know. A dynamic that just nobody's used to. It's basically I'm standing up in front in a room and preaching to myself. But Kevin, do you remember the first show we ever did together was in Saint Andrew? James, Saint James in Newport Beach? No, no, it was in the Cathedral in Fort Worth. Oh, that and one, yes, yeah, sure. We had a congregate. We had an audience of one, Suzanne Gill, <laughs> and you sat me down and you said, "Do you think this format will be a success?" I said, "Absolutely not." Video's not going to work. People, you know, video's dead. Videos, video is just for you know hobbyists and geeks and whatnot. And these two thousand word articles that I lovingly crank out—that is what people are used to. Well, I haven't written a two thousand word article in several years because I was wrong. Prince so dead. part, so but it's the same principle. I'm comfortable and mildly good at what I was doing, now I'm being forced to retrain myself. And whether or not I can pull it off is the key. Gavin, you've been doing this the longest. What have you learned the most over the, the couple of years of putting morning prayer or teachings online? Is long format good, short format? What did the audience really appreciate? Um, I have learned that there are specific demons sent from hell designed to disrupt technology. Oh, yes. And you should pray. <laughs> but they're sent to see you, Gavin, not all of us. <laughs> no, he got, he, <laughs> he, he's here every day. <laughs> How did you know? Hey, hey, George, when it screws up my internet, it, it affects a whole community. It does. It takes down Anglican <laughs> TV. I, so, yes, I agree, Gavin. Oops. So, um, but, but, but having said that, um, I think I'd like to say to the people who did it, if any of them are listening, um, be enormously encouraged because out there the Holy Spirit is going to have to have prepared somebody with a heart shaped, just ready to receive the message that you've given. And and the and the more incompetent you are, the more God will be glorified. Oh, absolutely. Because it will clearly yeah. be an act an act of the Holy Spirit. So we we shouldn't worry too much about competence although there was there was a terribly funny video going around of, of a pious evangelical vicar in a dreadful taste in blue sweaters who had and and, and obviously not an anglo-catholic because he had no idea how to manage candles setting himself alight <laughs> but, but what was wonderful was when he found that his sweater was burning on his back he was so sweet-mouthed about it. <laughs> there were no. He was just beautiful. There was no swear. Oh my goodness! I've become a Holocaust under the Lord. No. <laughs> it was the most English response to setting yourself aflame I've ever heard, except for maybe uh, uh, Latimer. But uh, here is he says, "Oh my gosh, pat pat pat!" It's like, you're kidding. <laughs> It was very funny. It so was. I think, first of all, pray, pray over the equipment. Mm -hmm. um, do it. Whatever happens, God will bless it. He'll bless your obedience and your and, and your trying to do it. I, I think we'll find that, as George said, there are skills to be learned, mm -hmm. uh, and there is no there is no contradiction between relying on the grace that God will do things, even if we're a bit lame. Uh, and developing skills to glorify him. So I think a number of people will develop great skills in this area. And 
uh, some of us early pioneers will 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 be jealous and want to catch up. Um, so I think I think it's a very exciting. But but one of the things that happened to me too, because the circle goes round to the end, was I I I uh, sent an email to the local Catholic cathedral saying, "Is there any way I can drop in at the back, please? I just need to get to mass. I just." badly need to would you know can i sneak in can i break in will you and they said no you can't we're really in lockdown but uh, but but there's a local parish uh, where where the priest might let you in he gave me the secret code to the door which was locked and said that if i had to be there sort of uh, covered in a mac and a hat and dark glasses five minutes before the liturgy and i checked no one was watching it and i snuck in and and it was just like the catacombs and and to tell you the truth tears ran down my face because i i i was so hungry to be in the in that place at that time and maybe what we're being given is a period of fasting from the incarnate tactileness of the eucharist and the broken word uh, and when we come back we will we may come back with such gratitude i, I think the church will be divided i think there'll be people who who get pruned off and they'll lose the habit and they can't be bothered and they'll forget. But I think the people who come back after this to be church together will come back with a very much clearer sense of how their hearts burn to be two or three together physically in the company of the risen Lord. About five. Yeah, I, I, I'd want to, Gavin's point about not being shy to try this is I think is a well, is a well, is good. Yes, yeah. But I, I, I urge people not to fall victim to the if we build it, they will come phenomenon hmm. um, of just doing it to do it. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury puts out videos. <laughs> um, and oh. I don't wish to be mean, but <sighs> Kevin, uh, how success, as, as a pro in this field, how would you evaluate the the spread of the Archbishop of Canterbury's videos. Now, if I were wearing my clergy collar at this point, I would push the little tab in so it wouldn't stick out an inch. I just, well, I mean, we've talked about this before. There, there is something we call Q, and there are people who are Q-less, and I'm not judging. It just, it's, it's just a, a matter of fact principle in broadcast. We've seen this from, you mentioned the, the Broadway people going to cinema in the 1920s. Uh, they had theater. They had drama. They could deliver the message in a two-dimensional format where people would listen and be entertained. Um, and Justin Welby and Lambeth and Church House do put out a lot of videos. Some get 30 views and some, if the Guardian or the Telegraph provide a link to it, will get a good 3,000 views or 1,800 views, which is great. I encourage that. I do want them to come out and uh, put as much on video as possible because that's where the audience is. But there's a cueless element we need to talk about sometime, <laughs> with which, <laughs> you know. Well, John Santamu has it. He has yeah, cue. John Santamu makes good TV. Mm -hmm. I may not agree with much of what he says, but he's he is entertaining, and he ha and I'm not saying. I'm not saying that it's pure entertainment or charisma value, but there is something about his presence that uh, causes you to watch. Michael Curry has Q. Yes, uh, Justin Welby does not. Yeah, yeah, it is what it's not is. Just, it's, yeah, but it's not. He doesn't. But it isn't just Q. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm I can't find in the online times the review of his service on Sunday. But but this was, I think, an agnostic coming to it. Uh, offering some criticism, saying, "Well, you know, the, the music was okay," uh, but he ended up by saying that the content—it well, wasn't just the charisma or the lack of it, but the content of what what Welby had to say was so lacking at such a critical time that uh, he said, I, I, "I wouldn't mind being on a committee where this man was chairman of the committee, but I don't want him as Archbishop of a church in a national crisis." Yeah. And I think that I think the trouble is this is this this. Well, well, we're back to accountability, aren't we? You can't be accountable if you don't have charisma. Sentamu has it, and he should, you know, it's one of the talents. He'll answer to God for using it properly. Welby doesn't have it. There we go. Um, but it's the fact that it's the fact that that's what's missing from the Archbishop uh, is is a 
an authentic answer to the questions that the three of us have been discussing. He, he could have chosen any one of the three positions that we've had. All of them are authentically Christian. Um, and um, the fact that we're comfortable with, with one or two rather than three, uh, that, that's neither here nor there. But he doesn't seem to actually have found an answer. A he doesn't have a word from the Lord coming through him. And that's, that's um, well, the people I'm cross with are not, not just him well, because he's acting within his limitations, I think, and can't be mm -hmm. blamed. I'm cross with the people who chose him uh, and, and put him in there as a politically correct project to turn the church into a, uh, into a, a, a PC, um, uh, a, a, a PC enterprise without any real sense of the criteria uh, that required for a, a holy church. And well, it's, it's their fault. Hold on. Uh, how do we explain Pope Francis or I'm going to say Anglican Archbishop Pope Francis, <laughs> because he came out as perfectly Anglican on Thursday and Friday, Saturday and Sunday. You ask, okay, that wasn't, yeah. I thought it was a rhetorical so, question. Uh, how about those George. horrible cardinals that chose him? <laughs> you, I thought you were just, okay, so are you setting George up to whack it down the line? No, no, this, I, want, I want your response to Pope Francis. Okay, um, so Francis and Welby sound the same in many ways, but they mm -hmm. are actually different creatures doing different things. Um, Welby, I might, Welby is without it, I think. I mean, just he just doesn't have it, uh, bless him. Uh, Francis is a much more complex picture. Uh, and um, one hears very good things about Francis from people who meet him in private. Uh, very bad things are reported about him by people who don't care. And then in the middle, you have Francis taking two opposing views at the same time and, and causing not a little bit of confusion. Um, I think the fact is that Francis is a creature of his time, he, he theologically his sell by date has gone. You know, this was all the stuff he's learned was the 1970s and the 1980s, and by by the by the millennium, it, all that stuff was tested and found not to work. But he's trying. I mean, one of the things he's trying to do is to take a quite an authoritarian, rigorous church, and to give it a human face. Um, and then to do that, you have to do it with great skill and great care. If you don't just turn it into a if you don't just protestantize it so it's the challenge the pope has got to do is to is to humanize a rigorous church without going as far as um as those who've left the church and and he's he's not doing it as carefully as he might but i i, I you know I, he's he when over the confession stuff he's trying to give hope to people who are stuck and who don't have access to the um to the ministry of the church so um you know the, the motivation was good and he may not be wrong but it plays very badly on a broad canvas george go ahead i was just going to say that what gavin was speaking of was that the pope said in this time of pandemic it's perfectly acceptable to give a general confession not an individual confession to a priest and that is a appropriate pastoral response but it opens a theological door in the anglican world there are two uh, sacraments, uh, real sacraments, and then we have five others. Now, all seven in the Catholic world are real sacraments. Confession, by making general confession uh, acceptable rather than personal confession, has been moved from the seven sacraments to the two plus five Anglican world. So Francis is taking a well is taking a good pastoral step, but in doing so, he gives ammunition to people. Uh, to criticize his Catholic rigor at this time. And so the question for Francis is, how do you thread the needle between maintaining Catholic rigor, whether it is on the, the uh, allowing uh, divorcees to, who've remarried to attend the Mass, uh, to receive the Eucharist, to uh, basically saying that you don't need a priest, you can talk to God in your heart, and that's perfectly fine. Well, those are wonderful Protestant thoughts, but they don't jibe with the uh, formal doctrinal rigor that the Church, Catholic Church has taught essentially since Trent, uh, about 500 years now. So it, it, for, for, some, for, for some Catholics of a liberal, progressive bent, this is, the Pope is right with it. He's really moving in times and trying to be with the people and respond to the needs. But then you have other Catholics who are saying that 
look, you know, just there's always going to be exceptions. There are always going to be extringencies. That's why we need to have an unchanging uh, revealed teaching on these essential issues. Is confession a sacrament or is it not a sacrament? And yeah. Yes, but he, but, but he didn't. But in fact, one of the things that hasn't been picked up is that um, you are entitled to to consider your confession to have been made if you make it personally to, to God, and then go and find a priest to incarnate it afterwards. And and that's that you know that's within Catholic teaching. And certainly Francis was allowing for that. I've heard um, that. Yeah, it, I've heard that. It, but 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 I think I think the problem with Francis is that he's he's such a sweet old grandpa working working out of of nineteen uh, seventies liberation theology that I don't think he's aware of how how sharp the minefield is i I think he genuinely means to try and make Jesus more acceptable within the Catholic Church to people who suffered at the hands of the rules uh, and so he's so you know on one side he has some very hungry people who badly need grace. And on the other hand, he has people saying, look, our experiences, once you begin to bend these rules, they stretch until they're moved right out of shape. And we're back to George and I uh, in the beginning, you know, with, with my saying, uh, um, I'm worried about diluting it and George saying, I don't want this too tight. We're, we're effectively all dealing with a, an amphitheater where we want the lines drawn in the best possible place. I think one of the things we should do is, 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 is not, um, uh, is not, disbelieve in each other's integrity while we try and solve oh, the problems I, I, we're doing. I don't think that's, you know, that's happening here. No, no, I wasn't saying, but, I wasn't saying we were. Okay, no, I didn't right, say it's happening here. Yeah. I'm the, just saying it's, 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 it's something we need to try and keep to. Mm -hmm. uh, if that, only people did it as well as we did it, Kevin. <laughs> okay. That's much now, but but, but kick, <laughs> kicking this issue upstairs, it, the uh, we jokingly say Francis is great Episcopalian, and I'm not talking about being in, uh, maybe he's trying to uh, do a hostile takeover of the church pension fund. If so, that's a good move. It'll bail that's out. That's a very the good move. <laughs> you can have the Episcopal but one. The, the Anglican experience over the last uh, now 200 years, Francis is compressing into a very short time frame. For instance, uh, this is a very controversial topic in some quarters, but auricular confession was actually forbidden within the Anglican world. It was said, you can't do this under, by General Synod, you can't do this according to the reformers. During the Catholic revival in the 19th century, we had people taking uh, portions of the prayer book and using them to justify uh, an action that wasn't really in conformity with the intent of the action. For instance, in the, Ang in the American world, we have uh, communion of the sick that you don't that you can do this and that they encourage a confession at that time. Therefore, you're not doing the general confession. But the whole purpose was not to open the door to auricular confession. It was in that limited circumstance where the person is too sick to attend. You can do it this way. Now, what does that mean? It means that people will take these limited circumstances and then make it the norm. And so now you have, within the Anglican world, you have the Anglo, some portions of the Anglo-Catholic movement having as uh, rigorous an understanding of the place of confession in their life as the Roman Catholic Church. Good for them, that's fine, but you have to realize this is a bending and twisting and changing. Now, from the opposite side, Francis is doing the same thing. Gavin has pointed out quite rightly that you can give your confession to God and then go around and have the priest uh, afterwards Incarnate, do sure. that. Yeah. What's going to happen if you follow the Anglican model, if you follow the way human nature works, is that people are going to wait to have that confirmed until they're at their deathbed. They're going to wait years. They're going to wait, you know, they're basically going to uh, not, they're going to, to misuse the intent and then take it and develop a new theology based upon what they wish to achieve, uh, hooking it into these limited circumstances. So that that's where I'm coming from. I'm not. I don't want to talk about auricular confession. I've <laughs> gone down this path, and there's some crazy people in Fort Worth who have a bullseye on my forehead. But uh, but, well, but as uh, I, I'll end this by saying, facts are facts. Let, let, oh, let's 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 back up. All right. 
Uh, let's just talk about the local pandemic in our areas. Um, cause I know that you're Gavin over in England and I've seen some interviews with Boris and his press conferences. I know George, you're in Florida where there has not been a breakout. I'm 40 miles North of New York city where New York city is being decimated, uh, by the pandemic. Uh, let's start with you, Gavin. Gavin, tell me a little bit about, you guys have not gone into lockdown yet. Um, Boris Yeltsin put a big, uh, uh, editorial of the newspaper, don't visit your mom. And then the next day at the press conference, he says, I'm going to go visit my mom. And I thought, you know, <laughs> there's leaders and there's leaders. What, what's going on over there? Well, again, they're, they're misreading human nature. If they had better theology, they would do better politics. Yes. So, so, <laughs> good so Boris, that's good. Boris, <laughs> Boris is a Pelagian and he thinks that you that just try, try a bit harder, chaps, and it will all come right. Uh, and his health minister is an Augustinian and realizes that people are fatally disobedient and they'll need to be controlled. So that's working itself out. And any minute now, the health minister will win and we'll be under lockdown, I'm sure, like France and like Italy. And, and I think that's, that's right. We had a weekend yesterday and people self-isolated by keeping as much as six inches between them as they went for walks in a park. <laughs> and, uh, so, um, but, but the more interesting question is what the death rate is, because mm -hmm. Um, the, the, mag the, the political journals are carrying uh, an analysis of the death rate. Uh, and it's like, you know, lies, lies and damn statistics. Because the death rate in Italy looks like it's 9%. Mm -hmm. And the death rate in Germany is 0.3%. And is this because the, 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 the Germans have a better vegetarian diet and, and don't eat so much pasta? Um, or is it because they test everybody more thoroughly and they don't make the philosophical mistake of of confusing causation and correlation? Well, because then I, the Italians... I, I, all you have is a tested death rate. Who's been tested? Who died? We don't have a open death rate. And so, so that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's the answer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and, whatever happens, too many people are dying, mm -hmm. uh, but but we don't know whether it's catastrophically too many or uncomfortably too many. Mm -hmm. and the other thing that's coming out of Italy is that everybody who has the coronavirus and they die are being listed as death by coronavirus. Yeah. So they that's may die. Time. So they may die of heart failure, kidney failure, COPD, and they have the coronavirus, but the death certificate is being written coronavirus whereas in germany they you know that's a comorbidity it's not the morbidity so we don't have apples to apples uh statistics in many of these cases yeah, so, they, and some of the statistics in china you just can't believe them and yeah. iran you can't believe them and but it's, it's not a universal in china some of the scientific work is is straightforward and honest but then when the government gets its hands on it who do you believe it, the China thing is really unique because I have missionary friends who are in Wahoon and they say, yes, we stop wearing a mask. But I know in Chinese politics, if I were the leader of that province or in leadership of the province, I wouldn't tell anybody bad news going up the chain. There's no way uh, um, the leadership of China is going to know what's happening in my province unless it's good news. And one of the things is we do have figures from Hong Kong, uh, which is part of China, but at the same time it has its own uh, government institutions. And the death rate is rising and the infection rate isn't rising in China because what's happening is that people coming into Hong Kong are bringing the virus back in and affecting a new ground because it's slightly mutated over the time it's left. And so we can trust the Hong Kong statistics, I hope. Uh, but we can't really trust the statistics coming out of Wuhan, about a Hubei province yeah. or and the city of Wuhan. Japan is having a little resurgent. Uh, Singapore seems to be the only one or so, in South Korea that have effectively dealt with it. They're not having a resurgence. So, well, One of the fun things, funny things about South Korea, which has not really received the attention that it should, is that 40% of those infected with the coronavirus were members of particular Protestant sect and this you may have seen the news pictures of these are the people that they are required to kneel in church a few inches from each other and hmm. not wear any protective covering or masks and so this one particular church became an epicenter such that the Korean uh, National Council of Churches of Korea uh, 
put out a, 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 a plea to the government to shut down this particular megachurch because of their worship practices. They were f causing 40% of the uh, illnesses. So that in Korea, you had a much more defined population target. Um, and so what they were able to do is what the, the people are hoping to do in New York City or San Francisco. Um, in other words, quarantine and shut down and lock down to prevent recirculation, re, uh, reinfection, and new people coming in. Florida, are you in lockdown? No, we're not in lockdown. We're in lockdown of uh, some institutions and restaurants uh, may only serve takeout food. But banks, stores, gas stations, I'm going to pick up a battery for a prisoner whose car died, and I'm going to put a battery in her Toyota Prius this afternoon. That's all open. Uh, my county, there are nine uh, cases recorded. Uh, there are less than a thousand cases in the state of Florida, which for its population size is very, very small. Um, we do have, and we have no parishioners with the virus. We do have people uh, at one degree of separation. We have one parishioner in her 90s whose daughter in her 60s in South Carolina who just returned home from the UK uh, with her grandchild. The, the, the 60 year old has been tested with a virus and is in intensive care. The uh, young girl in her late 20s is perfectly fine but may have the virus but has no virulent symptoms. And so we're starting to see that, but nothing local. People's relatives are being infected, but they're still in that danger zone, the 60 plus with underlying uh, conditions. But it hasn't hit here yet. Well, maybe it's because we're the back of beyond. Yeah. And nobody, nobody's <laughs> here, anyone comes here. Well, I, I'm in very populous Connecticut. Uh, if you just go through my customer base, I have a, a large customer that's a stamping facility where they just stamp product uh, little buttons or little uh, things for uh, customers and uh, their machines are far enough apart that they have no trouble having their guys come into work. Uh, each executive and each management person has their own office. Just go in there, close the door, do your work. And so they're open and uh, uh, they're th listening to the advice of the government and they're just uh, keeping distance even though all face-to-face -face businesses are supposed to be shut down uh, today. I have a customer that's a, a, a large trade school. All the students are working offline right now or online. Uh, and we're taking, all the teachers are 55 plus. And in a matter of, of uh, three or four days, we had to teach them to use laptops and webcams and deliver their classroom product online. It's worse than any thing I saw yesterday from all the priests. You guys did amazing, <laughs> okay? But having Joe the plumber teaching a class to plumbers is <laughs> much different over live stream. Uh, and I have another customer that is a, uh, a place that uh, provides flooring for commercial places like Staples or um, Office Max or Bed Bath & Beyond. They go in there and they lay down the tile they're they're decimated all the all contracts have been uh stopped and uh they're just at home right now uh that type of commerce has stopped so it's going to be interesting to see if we reboot ourselves in two weeks if there's an all clear or if it's a month some people are saying all the way till november um we as an economy are being stressed we as individuals mentally are being stressed we as a church are being stressed. Thank God we needed it. And, you know, we'll have to see what goes on here. A quick update on uh, Bishop Steve Wood, the Diocese of the Carolinas. As you guys know, he was taken to the hospital. He was uh, given oxygen. The last I heard, he is stable and he's still on oxygen. I don't know if it's a respirator or a nose or a ventilator. I don't know that, but I know he's stable. Keep him in your prayers. Do we have any other updates, George, on... Uh, sick individuals uh, in the clergy? Kevin, you've just teed one up for me. Okay. Uh, update on sick clergy. Uh, oh, the sick with the coronavirus. And, <laughs> just corona. And, and, and Steve Woods was one of the few act the bishops who was stable to begin with. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, apart from silly jokes. Uh, uh -huh. No, it's uh, this uh, first batch of Anglican Episcopal clergy who uh, the six of them who attended the conference in uh, 
in uh, Louisville, Kentucky in mid-February. They're all recovering well, and they're starting to give interviews to the press. One of them was the sister of the actor Matthew Broderick. She's a All Saints Beverly Hills rector. Um, my wife just stole my Vikings cup. Oh. <laughs> it's just not right. But these are breakable. No. Did you know if I drop this, it would just break? <laughs> no. <laughs> but the but um, what maybe because we're not really that effective. But I'm really more concerned about the financial consequences sure. of there being liquidity crisis for small businesses whose cash flow is stopped. The end of the month. Uh, are people going to be able to, are some people going to, can they meet pay, payroll? Uh, can they pay their rents? Can they pay their suppliers for the items that they've received? And I, I hate to bring up trickle down economics, but do the churches survive? Uh, do, do uh, you know, Bill and Nancy, uh, are they able to make their tithe? Are they able to uh, continue to support the church? And, you know, it's, it's it's that time it's it's a strange time it's a stressful time well the episcopal church in some ways is like a utility stock it uh, doesn't go up very high but it doesn't go down very low there's a certain uh floor to it whereas some of these mega churches who have are being absolutely devastated um what the, the uh, I think it was David Jeremiah or one of these TV uh, evangelical preachers who does a great job preaching. He was on the air this weekend, and he's got a place that seats two or 3,000, and there were 11 people in this oh, church. They, well, this was in Southern California, so they put the you know non-essential ban in. But for people whose cash flow requires hitting these financial targets every weekend, uh, this is going to be this can put them under yeah uh just a quick note uh, some of the work i did last week uh live streaming and teaching priest how to live stream that's still on facebook it's at a place uh, a facebook group called inexpensive church live streaming you can go to my facebook profile and i'll have provide a link to it if you can't find it um you're welcome to watch all those videos and links and learn how to live stream if you haven't done so yet uh, George watched them and he did a wonderful job. Gavin doesn't need to watch them because he's the pro over there in England. Oh no, you know? he watched, he learned so much. <laughs> did, okay, good, he good. learned a lot. <laughs> right. So please go watch those. Please catch us as we uh, tape again on Thursday and Friday and give you an update clearly on the pandemic and the stressed church. As, yes, as, Gavin? Uh, or George? George? I'm, yeah, I'm, George. Sorry. I, I'm the white man with the glasses. Uh, the slightly <laughs> overweight white man with glasses. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So I don't, don't know if you can tell us apart that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it may be exciting here because our bookkeeper is home with a fever and we'll find uh -huh. out tomorrow uh -huh. whether she has the virus. If so, I may be quarantined in my office and be wearing the same shirt on for Thursday or Friday when we film again. Yeah, one of the big, I've never run out of sweatpants before. I'm, I've just run out of sweatpants. This uh, <laughs> working at home thing is, uh, it's taking its toe. However, my wife works one floor below me in the kitchen. I work up here in the loft. Gotta say, you know, it, it has not stressed the marriage at all yet. But she's working away in the kitchen, Kevin. Is she, if we... Yes, my wife is working away in the kitchen. Isn't that cool? <laughs> so, ah, oh, my friends, I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to episode 586 of Stressed but Unscripted, Anglican Unscripted. <laughs> <laughs>